for the introduction, first of all. And, um, uh, and thank you, uh, Nathan, for inviting me to the, uh, <clears throat> the Southern Chapter uh, meeting. And, uh, you know, uh, it, you know uh, the pandemic has been a, a difficult sort of time for a lot of people. So uh, I'm glad that these kind of uh, online uh, uh, meetings have been very useful to sort of try and get the information through to, to patients. Um, so today, uh, I've been briefed with uh, uh, a number of things that I want to cover, and, and hopefully I'll be able to cover uh, most of them today. Uh, and if not, you know, I'm, I'm available for questions uh, uh, later on. What I'd like to do, I think, as a guide, is just to put up a PowerPoint, but um, I think really I want to have this as an open discussion, so if there's any questions, I'm more than happy to uh, uh, discuss So Please interrupt if, if you feel uh, you have a question. So let's try and share my screen. Um, Okay. Now, can you see the uh, can you see the first page of the presentation, Jesse? Yes, we can. Okay, great. So, so I'll just move on. Um, so, yeah, you know, what, what will I cover today? Well, there's um, there's obviously a, a lot of worry and sometimes a few lots of questions related to visits to see a retinal specialist. And, and so I'm going to cover those um, main questions and, and a number that have been prompted by uh, uh, Nathan and, uh, uh, you know, so asking uh, patients. Um, what I won't be able to cover today in, in a short space of time are specific <laughs> clinical trials or, or specific treatments for specific patients. Uh, and again, that may come along at, at another event at, uh, sort of further, further later in the year, hopefully. Um, but uh, I think I'll, I'll press on with the questions. Again, please interrupt if you have any questions. So one of the first uh, questions was, uh, what should someone bring to their initial consultation and evaluation with a retinal specialist? So, so um, to start with, first of all, uh, you, you know, um, the, so there's various different uh, levels of retinal specialists, as there are uh, various different levels of, um, uh, you know, sort of optometrists. And, um, and so a retinal specialist can be someone who obviously sort of specializes in the back of the eye and has done their residency and fellowship here. Uh, looking at the back of the eye, and and retinal specialists, are, you know, there are many of them, especially in, in California, sort of, uh, you know, uh, in, in San Diego, there uh, there are more than thirty or forty uh, retinal specialists, um, and and so they will obviously initially look at the uh, back of the eye, take a history, and they may do uh, quite a few things, including uh, genetic testing. Then there's another sort of level um, of retinal specialists in, in California who who um, deal with inherited retinal disease, and um, and there are people who've gone usually gone through fellowships or some research in inherited uh, retinal disease. And, and they may do a few other things because they've got specialist equipment. So, um, so I'm gonna really tailor these things more to the inherited retinal specialist, but uh, obviously some of these, these things may be pertinent to uh, a general retinal <laughs> specialist as well. Um, because I appreciate a lot of you won't have uh, close contact with uh, inherited retinal uh, specialists all the time. So what's important? Well, I think it's useful to get a background, especially of the disease, in terms of uh, having your own history, which will be uh, asked about in detail. <clears throat> if you have background files, then obviously that's useful, but not essential. And background imaging is useful, but not essential, because that gives some idea about questions such as progression or, or, or early diagnosis. Uh, one of the things that we, would be very important are the genetic test results. If you already have genetic test results, then these things would be useful because that would prevent further testing or retesting or a delay in terms of a treatment or going to trials. And what will you expect? Well, <clears throat> you should really be told that you would expect a two, sometimes three hour appointment with a dilated exam. And obviously that's quite distracting and sometimes difficult for, for some patients. So bring on sunglasses afterwards as well because you know, the brightness of the light and the testing is sometimes quite tiring. So, um, so just be aware that uh, you know there's a history, but there's also investigations and exams, which I'll go through. And um, so the, the initial appointment is usually quite long. So any questions regarding that at all? If not, I'm going to press on. If there's anything in the chat, maybe uh, I'll, I'll try and answer the chat and uh, Nathan can uh, alert me to those. So what type of visual tests are performed <clears throat> during the initial consultation and exam? Well, well, there's um, a varied number of tests, but the main thing, again, this is really to try and get the diagnosis. So I've, I've listed a few of these things here, and again, I'll, I'll speak through these if, if people can't see this clearly. So <clears throat> the most common tests are the color, 
on this exam or color retinal exam, something called the autofluorescence, which is usually nowadays done at the same time. And that looks at the background fluorescence of the eye. Visual fields of different kinds, but to work out and map how far people can see in the periphery or at the center where something called micropyrometry. And I'll show you examples of these just to sort of have these in mind. I'll talk through them. Some people may go through something called full field electroretinogram or ERG as we call it. And, and that's essentially like a uh, EKG of the eye and it covers the whole eye. If you're looking at central disease, there's another disease, uh, another test which is called multifocal ERG, which looks at the central function of the eye. Again, electrical test of the eye. And then much rarer tests, which is sometimes done on patients, um, are something called dark out optometry in, in patients who uh, obviously have, uh, have problems with dark adaptation, going from light to dark. And, uh, and research uh, is something called adaptive optics, which looks at the um, specific photoreceptor cells and uh, sees how they progress with time. But that's really much more of a research tool because it takes a long time to take those images. So that's quite a list, but not everyone will necessarily go through all of those. I'd say that most of the people will go through the first two, color fundus and autofluorescence. And, uh, and, uh, and actually, I forgot one thing I forgot here was uh, the OCT scan. So the OCT scan as well, which, is, uh, which I'll go through again. So color photo. So what I've done is put up a color photo here of um, these are patients' uh, images. So uh, of someone with retinitis pigmentosa. And uh, retinitis pigmentosa is a pigmented. Uh, parts of the retina, as the name comes from. And uh, what, what we're seeing here are uh, black spots or spicules, we call them, on the outside of the retina. And our imaging now is fantastic, so it goes across the whole of the retina, and you know, within milliseconds you can take a picture. Now, autofluorescence gives us a level of detail which is beyond color photos now. <clears throat> and again, autofluorescence is the cells of the eye fluorescing and showing function. Areas which are black, show a lack of function, and uh, usually um, some death of cells and low vision in those areas. Areas which are bright are under stress. So uh, again, for those who can see, you can, there's a black area around the outside where the cells are not seeing, and, and then the central area, there's some cells which are stressed with this little ring in the middle. And at the very center, there's relatively normal uh, uh, function, and that's uh, the small area of, of vision, and, and that's what quite commonly seen in retinitis pigmentosa with a tunnel vision. Then we do something called OCT, or optical coherence tomography. And this is another non-invasive test, which is done to um, uh, using infrared rays, looking at the back of the eye. <clears throat> and this goes down into very small detail. This allows you to look at each cell layer. So it's important to understand where the cell layers are. So there's various different cell layers here I'm showing in this image. And this is distorted by these big black areas because in diseases such as retinitis pigmentosa, <clears throat> there is often, in about 30% of cases, fluid at the back of the eye called macular edema. Macula is a central part of the eye. And we look at the different layers of cells because that gives us an idea of how far the vision is. And there's a certain layer of cells that we look at here called the photoreceptors, which are the cells that see, um, and that tells us a bit about the disease and can also be used for progression. Okay, so th those are the three staple tests that are done. And they're usually done relatively quickly after dilation, so they can take uh, as little as 10 minutes to do. Then there's some other tests which are functional tests, so not just structural tests, the function. And uh, this is again from a patient. This patient has uh, retinitis pigmentosa, and this is something called micropyrometry. So this is a visual field test where a patient has to look at uh, a light and a spot and press the button when they see the spots come up. And so this tests all the central area of vision. Now in this test, I'm showing again uh, different colors. Areas on the outside are black, which uh, signifies no sensitivity or poor sensitivity. And gradually, as you move into the center, there are more sort of green or yellow colors. And those are the most sensitive areas and almost normal near the center with good fixation. 
So again, this is a classical retinitis pigmentosa where there's tunnel vision. Macular disease will, will be the opposite. So there'll be a central uh, area or areas where uh, there's poor, sens uh, poor sensitivity and the outer areas will more likely be green. So that test 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 takes about um, 20 to 30 minutes. Uh, usually it depends on the level of, of provision because it's a retest certain areas. And then these are sort of rarer tests, but uh, are used in increasingly. So uh, are, are used to uh, identify disease when uh, you know, the genetic tests or other things aren't quite sure. And I'll show you an example of uh, that now. So the electroretinogram or the ERG, and that's usually, uh, where someone has to put their chin into a bowl. There's a couple of wires which are linked across the eye and um, on the side of the head, and they measure the electrical impulse across the eye. So when a photon of light goes into the eye and activates a photoreceptor, and in fact activates a number of photoreceptors, then that causes an electrical response which can be picked up. And so this tests photoreceptor function. And so this is an example again in a patient. Um, so I'm showing some uh, what we call A and B waves. So there's some black, there's some boxes, and that's where the normal should be. But what we're seeing here is relatively flat, uh, flat line, and that means that Hello. in the dark, the uh, patients are, yeah, are, are yeah. not seeing very well. And this again is indicative of retinitis yeah, pigmentosa. Yeah, I'm listening to a lecture. Okay, I'll move. But, but in this case, um, uh, actually, this patient. We couldn't find anything in the imaging and we thought oh well why is this patient not seeing and we tested them and they actually had vitamin a deficiency and that was the reason why so they've got a dysfunction but they've got nothing in the imaging and so when we gave back vitamin a this went back to normal i haven't got the normal here but uh, this patient's vision came back to normal so this is sometimes one of the areas where we use this kind of uh, functional test and there's other specific forms of this for the very central area of vision. So not to overload you too much, but just to say that we do some regular imaging, which is fairly quick, and then we do some other imaging uh, and functional tests. Um, some of these functional tests are done on different days because they take so long. So this will take, again, about 45 minutes um, to go through because there's a period where you have to dark adapt as well. Okay, so any questions about the imaging so far? So I've gone through. Okay, so I'll move, I'll move on. So, so the next question uh, asks, will a specialist encourage or assist in gene testing to identify a gene mutation uh, and the mutation causing the condition? Uh, and again, the answer is, uh, answer is yes, and it should be yes. Um, and you know, four or five years ago, I'd say the answer would mainly be no, uh, because there was really very little that we could do. We had a few free research tests that we could use. But now really, um, yeah, yeah, charities essentially like foundation fighting blindness who are the main sort of drivers of this have really sort of changed the, uh, the landscape of the genetic testing. And I think this has really not only given us information about patients, it's been useful for families, but more importantly, it's been useful for identifying patients for clinical trials and, and potentially treatments. So I'll go through the different types of testing, but I won't spend too long because I, I know that Casey will be talking about some of this stuff uh, later on and uh, in terms of the counselling side of things. So uh, I don't want to steal too much of her, her thunder. So what types of genetic testing are there? Well, um, previously, all of this used to be done really with the blood tests and uh, they only test a few genes. Um, so as little as one gene to panels of maybe uh, 18 to 20. But now this has changed quite a lot. So uh, I'd say in the last four, four years, five years, this has now really become a much bigger, not just panel, but uh, testing across uh, parts of the genome or the DNA. So we have coding DNA and non-coding areas. That means coding areas make proteins, which, uh, uh, or which some of them go into the eye, and non-coding areas, which are a bit like the dark matter of DNA. And so the majority of tests will check the coding areas because obviously they're the things which are most likely to cause disease. And that's what's test, tested in the My Retina Tracker test in Blueprint. And another free test that some people may use is Invito, which is sponsored by uh, Spark Therapeutics. 
And these tests um, come back within uh, sort of two months to three months. And uh, they test about 330 different genes. And uh, those are the most known, uh, most of the known genes related to retinal inherited disease. Along with that, there's um, a registry, which uh, again, I think will be talked about a bit later on, but I think it's very important to, uh, to put your name down onto for your clinical information and genetic information, uh, because that's run by, again, Foundation for Some Blindness. And when there's a trial that's suitable for a gene that's identified, then uh, you can be alerted through this registry. So let's talk about the testing a bit more. So the testing, as I said, takes about, is free uh, and is, it takes about two to three months to come back. And um, it has a hit rate of about 65 to 70%. So there, is, there are still 30 to 35% of people who do not necessarily get, uh, have, have a finding with this. And it's really important to have genetic counseling because it may have implications for you, other family members, uh, for trials, obviously. Um, but also there are a number of other findings that sometimes happen which are unexpected. And those things need to be talked about as well. So that's the free testing. And uh, I think most retinal specialists should, should do that. In fact, that's available to other retinal specialists as well. Um, and uh, the counseling is done uh, usually through the, the, the companies or uh, through blueprints and is organized by companies such as Inform DNA. Um, and in, in Vitae will do that as well. And there's also counseling in clinic, which uh, uh, you know, is what we tend to do because uh, we may need further familial testing. The next testing is specific paid testing, and, and, and that's really for certain diseases which go beyond or outside these diseases. And for instance, uh, you know, I've recently had to sort of deal with some patients who have albinism. That's not properly covered with some of these panels. And uh, there's also other diseases which lead, uh, for instance, deal with the front of the eye or, or nerve disease, which are sometimes not fully covered with these panels. And so we do specific testing, which uh, now, as I said, it's reduced a lot. Uh, you know, these tests used to be you know, eight thousand to ten thousand dollars, have now drastically dropped down to one thousand, two thousand uh, dollars. And specific pay testing for a certain gene can go down as long uh, as low as three fifty to about five hundred dollars. The next, the next stage is uh, something called whole genome testing, and that's, that looks at everything. So that looks at the coding areas and the non-coding areas because we're increasingly finding that those dark matter areas or non-coding areas are important for genetic eye disease. Um, now, now that, that adds an order of complexity to testing and analysis and doesn't still guarantee uh, that you're gonna find the gene, although it does increase the chances of finding it. And, um, but those tests aren't currently free because of their huge costs. So those, those tests cost around $5,000 to $10,000. So again, we do this as a staged process usually, and uh, depending on uh, what's, what's uh, available and also what we can spot before we talk about the latest tests. And then there are research studies which also do some whole genome sequencing. So uh, you know, without having to pay, there's uh, research uh, such as uh, those again funded by the uh, Foundation, Foundation uh, and here for instance, and uh, across Harvard and Texas, there's, a, um, there's the, the rare disease uh, genome uh, Projects are looking for the elusive genes, which are uh, not found by these other set forms of testing. So there's projects like that. And uh, for instance, we take bloods. In fact, we're going to take blood from seven patients on Monday with, with, with this. Okay, so that's a brief run through to the different kinds of genetic testing. And again, the majority of people have the free testing uh, at the top. And, and again, majority of people, a large minority, 65 to 70% will get diagnosis. And the importance of that diagnosis, as I said, is, is, is manifold, but again, that will probably be talked about later on. But there are also other items that may be done during the visit and talked about. And, and one of the most important ones is, uh, is low vision referral, so that you can get extra help to improve the vision that you already have. The other thing is, um, you know, a, lot of, a lot of people come in and uh, maybe on the first visit or later visits also need extra help with things such as travel, such as MTS uh, in San Diego or other transport systems with work or changing uh, work or occupational health. And for instance, the Department for Disability uh, does help people who are currently working or have recently been working and gives uh, tools and, and uh, uh, instruments to try and help with vision, such as special computers or, uh, or glasses. 
And there's other people who also require help with insurance. So we, we, we do that usually, uh, you know, um, within a couple of days of the, of the clinic uh, and some of those uh, forms are filled out as well. Uh, and this is one area that I'm, I'm really sort of um, trying, trying to work on along with um, certain centers for low vision, uh, which is uh, the psychological counseling because it, you know, a lot of my patients really have this shock at the beginning when they're first told about the diagnosis and, uh, and also the genetic um, uh, uh, diagnosis as well. So uh, this really is like a period of loss almost and uh, patients really need to be helped through this and not, and that requires help beyond the vision clinic. Okay. So let's go to another main bit. This is a common question and, uh, and a question which is it, yeah, thankfully increasing. And again, so five years ago, I would say that I just, I, I didn't have anything to say, say in this area. There was a, a couple of trials, you know, sort of a, there'd be a few trials at certain centers, which we couldn't really access. But thankfully, you know, with um, so sponsors from uh, industry and, and also uh, the work of FB again, um, these trials now, my job has become much more difficult because now I'm trying to work out which patients can go to which trials. Whereas previously, we were just monitoring patients. So as you know, there's one treatment that's been approved already uh, for an inherited retinal disease called Luxterna. And so we do genetic testing for that, definitely. Um, and uh, there's a number at uh, phase three. So again, I'll go through these trials very briefly, but everyone seems to know about trials nowadays because of COVID. So phase one is a safety trial. And that's a very small number of patients, you know, so usually six, maybe 12. Phase two looks at safety, but also a bit more at efficacy, whether it works or not. And then you may get up to 10 to 20 patients, uh, sometimes up to 30 patients, depending on the disease. And uh, with these diseases, phase three you know, goes up to the 40s, 50s, and 60s, and ideally more, but um, depending on the, the amount of uh, patients that there are. And that's an efficacy. So that's the last stage. So if, if you get to that stage and there's a success, then usually the companies go to the FDA and say, can you prove this? Uh, and, and, um, and usually after a six month to year process that they can approve that. So that's the traditional way of, of doing these trials. So thankfully a lot of these trials have now got to phase three uh, after years of work. And, and so a number of trials, including at, at, at our center, uh, we have uh, six different trials. Uh, I think five of them are at phase three. Um, they, uh, they are um, you know, getting hopefully close to a stage where these may be approved as treatments. So can a special specialist in running do a trial? Well, the answer is yes, potentially. So, um, uh, so especially if the trial is at the center, then uh, you know, how research is done, it's all voluntary. So it's not sort of done immediately. So usually what's ideally done is that a contact is made and some information is given to the patient at this, at this point for the patient to review. Because with every trial, there's potential benefits, uh, but uh, risks obviously as well, because these aren't treatments. And so uh, information is given, and uh, then another visit is usually made to um, go ahead and answer any questions and sign consent form and go through the trial itself. And so, as I said, for instance, what I would do is that I'd see a patient, and then um, after they've had the information, you know, usually a couple of days to a week afterwards, we can discuss about the trials. And again, everything's voluntary. Patients can withdraw at any time in these trials. And there's different kinds of trials, but I won't go into them uh, that bit of this, this uh, talk. I'll uh, leave that for another talk. Um, but, um, you know, they can be from just observing to interventional trials. So there's trials at the center itself, but there's a, not every center can do all the different studies because now there's about 40 to 50 studies, thankfully. And uh, so there's certain centers that have other studies. And for instance, for, for myself, we have a big network of um, collaborators. I go to these uh, meetings roughly every six months to try and get updates as to the trials. And uh, so hopefully I'm as up to date as possible, but that's not always the case. Um, but then we can refer on to the right centers. So one way of doing that, and the most common way of, of doing that is to get the contact of the clinical trial person at that place and for the patient's contact. And if they require any further information, then uh, the patient can let us know and we, then we, can, we can send on uh, uh, any, any um, clinical information. Usually what happens is after making contact with the clinical trial coordinator at the, that other site, 
uh, they will call the patient in, have a chat, and also do an initial screening visit and then work out whether they're eligible for the trial. Because just because you want to go for the trial, you have the right disease, does not mean you're necessarily eligible for the trial. So, so yes, they should, um, a retinal specialist should refer you to another centre uh, uh, if, if there's not a trial available, if you're interested. Okay. So, you know, um, so what happens is a lot of times the next, next question is about uh, patients and, and bringing in um, sort of information about uh, the condition, gene testing, clinical trials, related to the disease, and to discuss the findings. Uh, and do retinal spe specialists find this helpful and recommend clients to do this, do so? And, and for me, the answer is undoubtedly yes. Um, so um, what, what's great now, uh, I, I keep saying, is that patients really should be driving a lot of this. Yeah, we're here, we're here to assist, we're here to guide uh, and use our uh, clinical knowledge and, and information to try and um, uh, set you the right way. But what's happening is now there's increasing amounts of patient uh, interaction and groups. And, and, and as I said, there's so many different trials now. Um, you know, in, in the last four months, I've had uh, updates for about four or five different trials from phase one to phase, uh, phase two to three studies. And, um, and, that, and that gives uh, a difficulty in keeping up to date with some of these trials. So if there's something new that's spotted and something that we can help with, then we'll definitely come along and discuss that. Obviously, that's not always the case. Uh, and, uh, you know, I wouldn't build your hopes up necessarily, but, uh, you know, in some cases that has helped. For instance, an example I give is one patient came who has, a, uh, has been seen for years previously and then discussed two trials where they, they weren't seeing at all. And they discussed something called optogenetics, which is a, a trial that's recently reported in September to show success. And that turns cells which can't see into seeing cells. And so we discussed that trial. I managed to uh, sort of contact the uh, clinical trial coordinator at different sites. And um, then they attended the, uh, the, the, the trial, which was actually in Miami. So they flew all the way to Miami uh, to get their trial done. And uh, from what I heard, the, the, the patient's been treated. So, so yes, I think this is inherently useful. And uh, you know, we spend time and make time for, uh, for this discussion. So, sorry, I'm just having difficulty with my screen just here. Okay, yeah. So, okay, so the next question is, uh, how often should a person be examined by a retina specialist? What are the benefits of continuing exams? So, uh, so initially, um, you know, what I tend to do is uh, we have uh, initial follow-up. So there's the first exam, which uh, is, takes the longest usually. Then there's a follow-up, usually to go through the genetic testing results and the patients that I have genetic testing in. And so that's usually about two to three months. Yeah, there's different ways of doing this. As I said, there's sometimes genetic counseling, which covers that. But I like to also see the patients uh, themselves because there's usually a lot of questions that turn up even after genetic counseling. And the second thing that's important is that sometimes to confirm the gene, we have to test other family members. And so at the follow-up, we try to arrange uh, uh, other family member testing. So, so uh, I, myself, and um, my fellow who's in my clinic, uh, you know, Shaden Yassin, uh, so we'll, we'll try and uh, identify patients, call patients up, and sometimes family relatives to try and get the, the testing done to confirm the disease. And um, so that's why initially we have that first appointment and then two to three months. If there's other things such as trials and other things or other appointments or, or the sudden changes, then we'd see a patient sooner. And especially patients who um, uh, have fluid at the back of their eyes who require active treatment, uh, I'd usually see every three months at least. And if they need more treatment, then maybe sooner than that. However, generally, um, the follow up, and this is the category that the majority of people fall in, is the follow up is extended to uh, a year afterwards. and. Uh, or initially six months, then a year. And, and the reason is because we want to show a progression or see progression, which is the main question that people ask. It takes that much time often to understand about progression. The second thing is, um, you know, it's important to keep up to date on at least an annual basis. As I said, these trials keep reporting and there may be new trials that come along which um, are, are relevant. So for instance, in the last uh, two years, I said the optogenetics trials, uh, which look at uh, which are independent of gene uh, may be useful some, for some people um, because they uh, are able to treat patients with very low vision. 
and um, that, there could potentially be trials which would be of interest for a patient. Uh, on top of that, there could be gene therapy trials which are specific for the disease, which are also important. So that's why regular follow-up is still required, or, or, or suggested, and uh, I think beneficial. The other thing is that sometimes we have clinical trials, uh, and if patients are already enrolled in clinical trials, usually the follow-up is much more stringent. So patients are seen maybe initially after treatment, first couple of weeks, quite, quite often, then six months, and then at least uh, every year, uh, usually every six months with these trials. And at the same time as a clinical trial, which is research, uh, there may be a clinic appointment. So in those patients, there's a slightly different um, follow-up schedule. So that's the general reason for follow-up and how often it's done. Okay, so the next question, should an individual continue seeing the regular optometrist or ophthalmologist even though they are seeing a retinal specialist? So, so the answer to this, uh, I think, sort of varies. Um, so uh, if they have other conditions which are non-related to their genetics, then, then yes. Uh, if uh, they have refractive errors, uh, then, or, or need glasses or spectacles correction, then, then yes, an optometrist should be seen uh, on top of the ophthalmologist who doesn't always uh, deal with, with glasses. Um, I, I sometimes have, again, a, a specialized low vision optometrist to optimize uh, the glasses in, in, in my patients. Um, and so I'd refer on to them. Um, but um, if not, then obviously community optometrist who's, who's close by a good community optometrist can help with uh, certain vision requirements such as glare, near vision problems, magnification, um, that they would be very helpful. And, and there's many, many around. Then um, should someone follow an ophthalmologist? And, and the answer is again, yes. So for instance, some of my patients have glaucoma, uh, so a pressure disease of the eye. And, and those patients should, should be seen um, by the glaucoma specialist as well. Uh, however, if the main problem and the only problem is uh, the inherited eye disease, then um, uh, I wouldn't suggest unless you wanted to, um, you'd have to go and see uh, another specialist because the follow-up would be enough with uh, the retinal inherited retinal specialist or the retinal specialist. So, uh, so I think we covered quite a few things. Hopefully, um, uh, yeah, I think uh, definitely we, there with time, uh, I noticed there's a few things in the chat, but um, I, I didn't get any interruptions with anything. So if there's any questions, then please feel free to uh, ask and I'll try and answer those questions. Thank you. Nathan or Jesse, do you, did you want to um, uh, take on anything with that or did you want me to answer the questions? I think, uh, Nathan, you muted, yeah. There we go. I'll start with the first question from the chat. So how would one know if they need to see a specialist? They are referred to their local retinal doctor but did not realize that they had retinal degeneration of an unknown cause. They performed surgery for a retinal tear but they had no improvement and were finally referred to UCSF who did diagnose them. However, since the surgery, they do not qualify for most clinical trials. How would they know if they need to seek a specialist and when surgery is suitable? And doctor, now you're on mute. <laughs> so, yeah, so, so this, this appears to be, uh, you know, quite obviously quite a specific question. I think, so, um, you know, generally, so, so, so I think some of the difficulties here are, are um, who you go and see, and, and the quality of care that, that, that's received. Um, so, so the basic um, uh, ophthalmologist should, or retinal specialist should ideally uh, do the first three bits of imaging that I also mentioned uh, in some kind of way. So that's the color uh, testing uh, and the OCT. And some of them, and most of them will do autofluorescence, the autofluorescence as well, which would help. So, so from that, um, you know, uh, I suppose we're talking about retinal degeneration here, but it can be easily a macular degeneration here as well. Um, you know, fr from that, that that would be enough to sort of start thinking, okay, uh, you know, what other symptoms are there? And, and then to refer on to potentially specialist senses if, if they can't deal with it themselves or, 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 or don't want to deal with it themselves. Um, 
And so, so yeah, UCSF is one of these specialist centers, obviously, sort of, um, with uh, Jackie Duncan, who's one of the, the head of the scientific committee of the FFB, um, sort of there. And, um, and so sometimes it requires referral to, to one of the specialist centers. And, you know, the, the way that the system works here is it's sometimes difficult because it depends on insurance and, and, and uh, which pathways, but, uh, you know, the minimum should be for that. And to, so, so I think really some of this is dependent on the patient to really ask and advocate for themselves in terms of the uh, retinal specialists and asking, you know, uh, do I have uh, inherited retinal degeneration? Do I have a specific kind of dry type degeneration? Would that benefit from going somewhere else or referral somewhere else? Uh, because you're aware that there's trials. And, and this is what these talks are about, really to, to make sure that people are aware of different things and then which pathways to take. Thank you. And our next question was, I have AMD, wet one eye, dry the other. My wet eye has some damage in the center as well as to one side. My retina specialist said it was all AMD. Should I get a second opinion with another specialist? What do you think about the anti-VEG implants um, that deliver the treatment over, over a year to reduce risk with more frequent injections? Um, is it accurate for this? To, is it accurate this is up for FDA approval uh, so towards of the trail pipeline? Yeah, so, so um, you know, uh, as I said, I think it's going to be difficult for me to answer specific medical questions here uh, about, uh, about about patients, um, really because I don't have all the information. Um, so, so just to get a background, you, you have age-related macular degeneration, so wet, uh, uh, wet in one eye and dry in the other. So, um, so second opinions, um, I mean, this is something that's commonly seen by a, a retinal specialist. So... Um, Anti-VEGF, so just for people that don't know, uh, um, these are injections which are given to the eye um, to stop new blood vessels coming in the wet form macular duration. The dry type doesn't have treatments at the moment. However, there are trials, and some of them are at phase two. Uh, there's, there's, some at, there's about three ongoing in our center, for instance, uh, but other centers also, also have these. Um, uh, so again, the trials, not treatments. So the questions I think here are really about this, um, uh, the treatment of the anti vegf So at the moment, as I said, they're done as injections. And sometimes this can be as, as often as monthly, which is you know, a quite a, literally a pain for patients, but also a uh, difficulty in terms of uh, organizing. So the limitation is that the drug doesn't last very long. It doesn't have a long half-life in the eye. So now they're making different types of drugs. So uh, one of them uh, is a combination treatment, uh, something called Fericimab, which has just been uh, approved. And is about to come onto the formula references here. Uh, another another way of doing this is to put a little implant in the in the eye uh, as a, like a, a slow release. Uh, that requires a, a relatively big operation um, uh, initially, and then uh, then roughly every three months or so, this can uh, be filled in with a reservoir. Um, there are increased risks with it, uh, such as infection in the eye. Obviously, we have an implant in there, and obviously pain and inflammation as well. Um, but um, over the trials, they seem to be uh, okay. And I think this has already been FDA approved from what I'm aware because uh, really this is again about to come into the formulary here. Um, so, so the answer to that is yes, but there's gonna be more things coming through. At the moment, there's still the gold standard is uh, the injection into the eye. And, um, and I think you, know, you have to discuss those other options depending on your disease with uh, your retinal specialist. We had another question come in from Shauna, and Shauna, all, all questions are appropriate, so don't worry. Um, are there any recommendations for specific sunglasses to protect for, from sun glare for people with RP? Yeah, so, so I think, um, you know, one of the biggest problems in patients with RP, it was two, two things. One, one is, I think, uh, stress that goes to the back of the eye, because basically you want to avoid stress to the cells. So, so we grow, I grow these cells in, in, in the lab, and when you put stress, like, such as UV light or blue light, then the cells aren't happy and, and they're more likely to die. Um, so um, so the, the, the question is, you know, so what do you, uh, what do you do to try and prevent that? Well, you definitely have sort of a good wraparound sunglasses uh, that, uh, that prevent UV light, especially in direct sunlight, so not all the time. Um, and remember, that it can't be too dark because obviously that will cause problems as well. But the other problem is glare, and, um, and that's really because of a dysfunction of the, uh, the retinal cells, uh, so they're not coordinated to the back of the eye. And, uh, and that can, again, be helped by these wraparound sunglasses, especially when outside. And you know, certain lights cause them as well. So definitely lighting can help as well inside the house. So, so I think yeah, there, there's certain uh, optometrists that you can go to who maybe specialize more in the, these kind of things. 
Um, and there's another problem in diseases such as achromatopsia, which is a special a glare form disease in younger patients. And, uh, and they sometimes need colored, uh, uh, colored lights to sort of, uh, or colored glasses to try and help them. But I'd say a good wraparound pair that of sunglasses that protects against UV light that isn't too dark is, is probably the mainstay of treatment. Thank you. And then does red light treatment damage or help eyes? Yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm not sure where, where that um, necessarily comes from, but um, you know, uh, red lights often use, you know, so to protect uh, the eyes. For instance, um, you know, we, we use red light when we're preparing our patients for the, the ERG, which is the EKG of the, uh, the eye. Um, so from evidence at the moment, again, looking at clinical trials and evidence, there's, there's no clear uh, treatment that, that red light helps. I, I think, um, you know, what, the patient may be alluding to are uh, these uh, these goggles. I think there was someone um, actually who I worked with called Jeffrey Arden, uh, who was an ERG specialist uh, uh, at the Moorfields Eye Hospital. He developed these uh, green and red lenses in a trial, and um, he suggested that sort of certain lights, especially at nighttime, if there's a current that uh, had less energy uh, or, or resulted in less energy being used by the eye, and it can protect it against things like diverting macular edema. Um, I'm not sure there's a clear enough amount of evidence uh, uh, for using this, so I haven't really recommended this for any of my patients, and not, not in RP anyway. Great, thank you. And do we have anybody who wants to come off a of mute and ask a question directly? Just get another one from the chat. How often should my children be seen by an ophthalmologist? They currently do not have any symptoms. Sorry, doctor, you're on mute again. So, so Mark, yeah, sorry. Um, so, so Marcia Lowe, I think if that person could just um, maybe unmute, that'd be great. Because obviously there's specifics to this. So if I assume the fact is that they're a child of someone who's got, uh, is affected by, by disease. I mean, children should be seen at least yearly um, anyway um, by an optometrist, uh, uh, I think. And, and that's what I generally recommend for most uh, uh, children. If they're a child of someone who's got inherited uh, eye disease, obviously you've got to look at the uh, inheritance pattern because certain diseases run through every generation of the family. Certain diseases uh, are, are just stay in one generation. Uh, and so it depends on the kind of genetic eye disease. Uh, and then if, it was, if there's a let, little risk in the next generation, that should be a just annual visit. Um, and if it's, uh, again, someone who's at risk, so for instance, a dominant eye disease or an X-linked eye disease, then it would be worth, um, uh, again, sort of seeing them at least every year, maybe with an eye specialist as well, uh, a retinal specialist as well, rather than just an optometrist. Great, thank you. Um, I think there's a question here about, I think it's been mentioned, is it Marsh? Yeah, yeah. So uh, asking about vitrectomy, I think, yeah, she said that. Uh, twice now. So, so vitrectomy is um, uh, basically the eye is filled with a jelly called uh, the vitreous a gel and that, that's there from birth and a vitrectomy is an operation to remove the gel of the eye and I think maybe the first question was about a vitrectomy and a surgical repair. I'm not, I'm not sure if that was the, maybe it wasn't, no, it was a, but a vitrectomy is, is something that's sometimes used when you have a retinal tear or retinal detachment. That's the most common use, use for it. Sometimes a bleed in the eye, very rarely for floaters in the eye. However, for um, our gene therapy uh, operations now, uh, we use, also use a vitrectomy to clear the gel of the eye and then putting a, uh, an injection under the retina of the eye. So vitrectomy is now used for lots of different things, uh, but they wouldn't necessarily be used for uh, inherited disease or macular degeneration. And they're not the normal treatment for, for those conditions. Wonderful, thank you. And if there's any other questions that you think of after today or, or in the future, please email us at chapters at fightingblindness.org and we can definitely forward those to, to Dr. Bora to answer those and, and get those answered for us. But thank you for your time today, sir, and uh, have a great weekend. And I really appreciate all your answers and all the information you, you shared with us this, this morning. No, thank you, Nathan. It's, uh, it's a pleasure and uh, sort of happy to answer any questions. And it's uh, good to see some familiar uh, names and faces here as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, doctor. Really appreciate your time.
And so now we're moving on to part two of our format today, which is working with a genetic counselor. And I'd, it's my pleasure to introduce Sherry Lawrence, the Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Accessibility Chair for the Los Angeles chapter. Thanks so much, Nathan. Um, yeah, so that was great information. And now we're gonna dive into a little different area. Um, so with the increasing number of gene-specific therapies being developed, an accurate genetic diagnosis is so important for any person with an IRD. Um, the Foundation Fighting Blindness offers a no-cost genetic testing and counseling through blueprint genetics and informed DNA. So that's pretty cool. This genetic test is specifically targeted to those with an IRD and is the most accurate scientifically advanced and highest quality test widely available to patients today. So really you need to take advantage of that. After testing, joining the My Retina Tracker Registry allows input of your genetic testing, your results, and other important data of interest to researchers and companies planning studies and trials. But what does genetic testing actually tell us? Gene testing is completed and results have been received. Whether positive or negative, now what do we do? What does a person do with this information? And how does the individual decipher the material? What questions should we all be asking? And this is where really a genetic counselor comes into the picture. And we happen to have one today. So we're pretty lucky here. Uh, Casey McKenna is a senior genetic counselor at Informed DNA, where she's provided patient care through FFB's My Retina Tracker program for the past five years. She completed her master's degree at Mount Sinai School of Medicine in 2013 and started her career working in pediatrics at the University of Virginia. Her areas of specialty include retinal disorders, inborn errors of metabolism, storage disorders, and hereditary cancer. Casey? like to introduce you. Great, uh, I'm glad to be here. There you are. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for being here. Um, I know that we have probably a lot of questions out there and I'm just gonna start with a few and uh, please just jump in as I ask your question. So first and foremost, what is a genetic counselor? So a genetic counselor can be defined in so many different ways, but I like to think of us as the liaison between the genetics that happens in a laboratory and the genetics that's applicable to patients. Um, we've, some of us have seen these genetic testing reports that come back and they are not in plain English, but it's really my job to translate that genetics speak to something that's tangible. Um, in addition, thinking about um, specific patterns of inheritance and risk to other family members and potentially connection with clinical trials as well. Um, so we're your experts to turn that lab jargon um, into something that you can understand. And we love questions. Um, we typically have hour long appointments, sometimes longer, um, where we're, we're really able to dedicate some time to hearing your story, to learning about your challenges and learning a little bit more about the genetic um, background or really the why um, for some of these inherited retinal disorders. No, that's so awesome. I've actually seen a result and yeah, I couldn't make heads or tails of it. So <laughs> thank goodness for you. Um, so how do we go about finding one, uh, a genetic counselor? What's the best way to, to reach out? Yeah. So Sometimes, especially at larger university hospitals, there are genetic counselors on staff. They might be located in a neurology department or pediatrics or cardiology. Some centers even do have um, dedicated ophthalmology um, based genetic counselors. Um, so the first time place to look is really to ask your, your retinal specialist. 
However, we've already learned about this My Retina Tracker uh, program, and I think that's the best way these days to get connected to a genetic counselor. Um, while genetic counseling uh, services are covered by many insurances, they unfortunately are not covered uh, by uh, government-sponsored health plans. So really the advent of this My Retina Tracker provides genetic counseling free of charge to any patients who want it, um, and even some who maybe are a little hesitant to partake in genetic counseling as well, um, but with while removing that financial barrier. Um, so what happens is a patient provides a saliva sample in the privacy of their own home, maybe in their doctor's office, um, and they, the doctor's office will have it mailed to the laboratory called Blueprint. And then Blueprint sends the results not only to the retinal specialist, um, but to us at Informed DNA. Um, we have four genetic counselors who are dedicated to this My Retina Tracker program. Um, we see patients in all 50 states, but basically you'd get a phone call saying your testing has started. We're going to call you when it's done. And at that point, you can schedule an appointment uh, with me or there are two other genetic counselors, uh, Kelsey Zegar and Amy Sufka that you may have spoken to. They're also licensed to practice in the state of California. Um, so, well, and, and that takes place, obviously, we could do that over Zoom or, you know, virtually. No one has yeah. to go anywhere. No one has to go anywhere for the, the telephonic uh, genetic counseling that's part of the My Retina Tracker program by default. Um, and it isn't even video, um, something that we found for our low vision patients, having that low stress environment where we're just really able to have a conversation is what we're aiming for. So, you know, there's a dog barking in the background, you go ahead, take care of it. You need to refresh your coffee, no problem. You know, we want you to be comfortable um, enough to open up and to ask questions that, that might really have impact for you. Wow, it sounds so easy. And I just want to repeat, you just said it was also free. Yeah. So I just want to stress that because mm -hmm. that's fantastic. Right. And I should add, there are also... Um, national directories for genetic counselors. Um, so we do have a, a National Society of Genetic Counselors. Um, NSGC.org is always a place where you can find a genetic counselor. You can sort by specialty, sort by state, or who's able to provide telephonic services. Well, it sounds like there's a lot of benefits to, you know, having that phone call. Um, can we really make sense of it all, like when we're done with that call? I mean, what is the information in sort of layman terms that we really find out? Sure. So genetic counseling is a little bit of back and forth. Um, while I have those test results in front of me when we start our conversation, what I know about you as a patient is probably just a couple of sentences from the doctors. And so and so is an 81 year old female with a diagnosis of retinitis pigmentosa. She has no affected family members. Now, Sure, we know what garden variety looks like. We saw Dr. Vora present those slides. You see those bone spicules in the back of your eyes. You have your peripheral vision loss and difficulty seeing in the dark. But that's not everyone who has RP. There are some people who are diagnosed with atypical RP or late onset RP or sometimes very early onset RP with abnormal eye movements. That might be more of a labor congenital amaurosis diagnosis. Um, but ultimately, really learning about a patient and how their vision has changed over time can help me as a genetic counselor to better interpret the test results just for you in general and not just that piece of paper. Um, we also go through the family history. Um, sometimes patients feel are able to enter that information online beforehand, which is really helpful, especially just getting your parents talking, getting, oh, Uncle, Uncle Barry, he had, he didn't drive, did he? I wonder why that was. Um, so it gives you some time to prepare um, if you'd like to, and we'll draw out that family tree um, and put it all together. Um, so sometimes these genetic testing results are not straightforward. Uh, sometimes they are, in which case I might be superfluous, and you can tell me that. Um, for example, someone who has a diagnosis of a Stargardt macular dystrophy. If they come in and they are the only person in their family that's affected, they don't have any other health problems, and their test results come back positive and consistent, that they have two mutations in the Stargardt gene called ABCA4. Great, that's a perfect match. However, it's not always that simple. 
What if someone comes in with a diagnosis of retinitis pigmentosa, has an affected parent, and has two ABCA4 mutations? Our interpretation is going to be quite different. And we'd be concerned about what we call the phase or how many mutations are coming from each parent. So really knowing that family history, oh, there's a fly, um, is something that can be quite helpful. Um, even if it seems a little bit overkill for a telephonic appointment, we are able to review those results, interpret them for you, and also for the family. Um, a lot of times, especially our adult patients will ask, what's the chance that my kids will have it? Or what's the chance that my grandchildren will have this? Or my brother or my sister, my niece, my nephew. Um, and oftentimes with diagnostic test results where we know what the genetic cause is, we're able to determine who in the family may or may not be at risk. And thinking about what other family members might benefit from genetic testing, whether that's making sure that mom is safe when she's driving at night, she might have a very mild form of RP, or whether it's uh, your niece who's 22 and starting to plan a family of their own and wants to know the chances that they might have a child with a significant vision impairment. Um, and I know we're all most excited about the small percentage of patients with these inherited retinal disorders where their specific gene and sometimes even their specific mutation might match them up with an ongoing clinical trial. Well, that leads me to my next question actually, which is, can you and other genetic, genetic counselors actually help with clinical trial enrollment? So there is a large amount of overlap between the role of a clinical genetic counselor and a clinical research coordinator. Um, you might find some who have both titles. Um, me, I'm on the, the genetic counseling end of things. So while I can tell you if your particular US2A mutation is in exon 13, um, I can do that. And that's what might be needed to help figure out if you would be a good fit for a clinical trial. Um, but typically we ask patients to talk to their retinal specialists about the feasibility of a, a clinical trial. Um, as Dr. Bora said earlier, sometimes those retinal cells die off and a gene specific therapy might not be the best route. Maybe optogenetics is a way to go. Um, and certainly information that's available online can be tricky to wade through. Mm -hmm. um, so I would encourage you to look, definitely look when you get those test results back. Your genetic counselor, you can ask those questions, we'll, we'll double check for you. Um, but I often like to tell patients that they are able to search themselves in a reliable fashion. Um, great resource is a website called clinicaltrials.gov. Um, and when you get to that website, clinicaltrials.gov, just in case you forgot to write that down. Um, but when you get there, you can type in your gene name. And for example, if you type in RPGR, you're going to find some, some ongoing clinical trials that are really exciting. In fact, there will be more than one. And you'll read through all of this technical jargon about inclusion criteria and exclusion criteria. But if you scroll all the way down to the bottom of that page, you will find contact information uh, for the study coordinator. And that's typically a good place to start, um, maybe just shooting them a quick email saying, hey, I have a mutation in the gene that you're studying. I'm wondering what else you can tell me. And ab asking those open-ended questions of researchers um, can be really powerful, even if you're not sure what to ask, um, what can you tell me? That's really great information. Um, speaking of questions, I think my, my last question really is, so we're on the phone. Would you recommend any specific questions that I really should be asking you? Yeah, so I think, so one of the big questions um, is, uh, what, what could the effects be for my family members as well? Um, that's a big one that we get um, in addition to asking about the, the clinical trials. Um, I'm worried about Susie. Is she gonna have the same problem? Or my son wants to be a pilot. How, what do I tell him? What are the risks? Mm -hmm. And really at what age is it appropriate to test? It winds up being a consideration we don't think of very often. So. There are a few different patterns of inheritance um, that often genetic testing is able to help us determine the risks in the family. So there are three main forms. The, the most straightforward one is called dominant inheritance, 
where someone is affected and so is one of their parents and so are around half of their children and half of their siblings. Because we have two copies of each of our genes, one from mom, one from dad. And in a dominant gene, having just one genetic change or mutation, it dominates over the second normal copy of that gene and therefore the retina doesn't maintain its health the way we'd like it to. And in that case, um, if your son wants to be a fighter pilot, well, they have a 50% chance of having the same mutation. And while I should clarify that having a mutation isn't something that can predict the severity of disease or the age of onset of disease, it is something where uh, we can do predictive testing for the majority of genes to see what a risk to family members might be. Now, for that one person, it's of course binary, either they are positive or negative. Um, and some people want to know this information and some people really don't. Mm -hmm. There's an argument for letting Johnny start pilot training and as long as his eyes measure up to let it slide. Um, sometimes we get concerned about discrimination too in terms of genetic testing. Um, I should be clear in the United States, there is a law called GINA that protects against discrimination for genetic testing results in terms of health insurance or private employment, but there are some limitations like life insurance or disability insurance or long-term care insurance. So just because a test is available doesn't mean that you need to know the answer if it's not actionable. So I, I think it can be really complicated thinking about who to test in a family and really why we're testing. Are we testing to make sure that they're being safe driving at night? Or is that a, something that we can get, have evaluated clinically by a doctor and they might not want to know the binary yes or no answer? But then, yeah, so that's dominant inheritance and it's not the most common. Um, in fact, the majority of retinal disorders are inherited in what we call an autosomal recessive manner. Now, autosomal just means it affects men and women at the same rate. Um, but recessive um, refers to the fact that if someone has just one mutation in a recessive gene, that gene mutation, it recedes and allows the second normal copy to take over. So someone with just one mutation in a recessive gene is what we call a carrier or a reproductive carrier for that condition. And if both mom and dad have one mutation and they have a child together, there would be a one in four chance every time that the child would have both mutations and therefore develop the retinal disorder. And this is something that can be pretty powerful because as long as we're not marrying our close relatives, oftentimes with recessive inheritance, the, the next generation isn't at risk because both bloodlines, both mom and dad, um, need to have a mutation in order to have an affected child. So then as long as your reproductive partner doesn't have a mutation in your gene, the chances of having an affected child are pretty low. Um, so oftentimes it's testing of that second bloodline um, that can be really informative um, in terms of answering those questions about relatives. Uh, briefly, there's one last form of inheritance that, um, it, that we see um, called X-linked inheritance, where typically men are affected and their mothers are carriers, but sometimes also affected um, with some vision problems as well. Um, those are the three main ones. Um, the things can get a little bit tricky if we talk about mitochondria, but I'm thinking that if we get that far, you should probably be speaking to a genetic counselor. Well, um, but, that's a lot of information, but it's really yeah. powerful. And what I really, what I really loved about what you said, besides everything, is, you know, we're able to ask you just regular questions about kind of our life like what do you feel what might happen you know your your pilot example of Johnny and you know I wouldn't have thought that I would have thought it would have been more about the results but it sounds like your counseling goes further than just that absolutely um, rarely some of these genes or some of these genes have other complications so say Johnny's father had a PRPH2 mutation, or actually I won't say gene specific, say that they had a mutation in X gene, and it puts them at an increased risk of having a certain complication. 
Um, sometimes that's a splitting of the retinal layer. Sometimes that's abnormal blood vessel growth um, mm -hmm. or what we call neovascularization that can happen in the back of the eyes. And knowing what complications a person might have but above and beyond what's typically associated with RP like cataracts, um, knowing what to look out for can be pretty important. You know, if you're at an increased risk of having a retinal tear, you should know which doctor you would see if you ever started showing signs or symptoms. Um, and same thing with your close blood relatives, whether or not they're, they've done their genetic testing. Um, oh. So sometimes we do get actionable information about the eyes. And sometimes we get information about our health outside of the eyes. Well, the vast majority of these inherited retinal disorders are isolated just to the eye. Sometimes they're what we call syndromic, where there might be other physical features or health problems that have popped up during a person's lifetime. An example would be like senior Logan syndrome, where there's typically retinitis pigmentosa, but also an underlying cystic kidney disease. And if you tested positive for senior Logan syndrome and your kidneys haven't been evaluated in a long time, or say you're a kid and they just haven't been checked, that's probably something we'd need to do. Um, while in those cases, many of the syndromic uh, genes don't have an ongoing clinical trial, they still might have some very um, actionable management recommendations. Wow. Well, I know we're kind of coming towards the end of our time, but is there anything Anything else you'd like to add or you feel we should know? Yeah, absolutely. So I have a couple things. Um, the other one, other question I would recommend that you ask your genetic counselor is, what are the limitations of this test? Because I know some of you have had genetic testing more than once, maybe more than twice or three times over the years, um, sometimes as part of a research study, sometimes as a free test, hopefully, sometimes something that um, you paid for out of pocket or through your insurance. And there's, there's a, a decent amount of redundancy. And so one thing that I would recommend to ask is what are the limitations of this test? For example, if your family history is consistent with X-linked retinitis pigmentosa, where men are affected and women are mildly affected, um, if at all, well, the, the Invite test doesn't cover that RPGR gene um, to, to modern standards. As Dr. Bora was saying, not all changes happen in what we call our exons or the regions that are expressed and make a protein in our body. So understanding what was looked at and if what was looked at was relevant to you is pretty important. Um, the newest iteration of this blueprint panel does include some albinism genes because sometimes there is a overlap in diagnosis. Um, I saw a patient last week who came in with a diagnosis of retinitis pigmentosa and left with a diagnosis of uh, oculocutaneous albinism. Um, mm -hmm. So things can change. Um, but if the test didn't include albinism genes, then that could make um, interpreting a negative or non-diagnostic test result rather complicated. Mm -hmm. Wow. Um, I have a couple other things, um, which is in terms of preparation for a genetic counseling appointment, I would definitely encourage you to get a copy of any test results, any genetic testing results that you've done that have been related to the, to the eye. Your 23andMe results, we don't need those, but if you tested through Spark and then you tested through my retina tracker and then you did a research-based exome or genome, having those beforehand can really help me and my colleagues uh, pick through what you've had testing for and see if it's either complete and great, you've done your due diligence, we'll talk again in a few years when we get smarter, or, oh, this one gene is missing. And I think that really matches with what you're telling me about your history, what you're telling me about the family history. So let's talk about how we get to those genes. Is it something that can be um, ordered domestically. There are some genes that aren't even analyzed in the United States. For example, the blue cone monochromacy genes, where there might be additional testing, even if the test itself says comprehensive retinal dystrophy panel, and it is pretty darn comprehensive, there, there's limitations to every test. Um, and on that note, I would say that if you have had genetic testing and it has come back positive, 
hold on to that piece of paper. Take a picture on your phone if you'd like. Um, you recommend you uh, save a PDF of those documents somewhere you'll be able to have access to them because repeating genetic testing is unnecessary. It's costly. You were born with the genetic instructions that you have today. Um, and so looking at them once, keep it, save it, and you should never have to redo it again um, as long as testing has come back positive. But if testing has come back inconclusive or non-diagnostic, because around 30 to 40% of the time it does, um, then typically we recommend consideration. Whoops, I think we just lost Casey. Um, let's see if she pops back in. Maybe that fly hit leave or something. The joy of technology. Right. Give her just a moment to pop back in. Here. Yeah, I think she was winding down, but I'm guessing she'll leave and come back. A lot of great information. Honestly, I feel like it, I couldn't even write it all down fast enough. <laughs> I know, I'm glad we're recording this. Yeah, definitely. I think people will appreciate that. Hmm. Well, she may have lost the internet. It's not popping back up in real here at all. Well, she was terrific. <laughs> Perfect timing for one of our guests who just actually popped in. Um, Michelle Goldfarb Shapiro, welcome to the call. This is perfect timing. Our, our panelist who's speaking just lost access to the internet and, and disappeared. So we'd love to have Michelle come on. Michelle's our director of events and tell us about some upcoming exciting events in the Southern California area and beyond. Good afternoon, everyone. Nathan, thank you for the introduction and hopefully that the individual gets their internet back. As Nathan mentioned, my name is Michelle and I oversee our events in the West region of Foundation Fighting Blindness. And we have a few exciting upcoming events that are taking place that we'd love for you all to join in on. So most in the immediate future, we have Hope From Home, which is our national virtual interactive gala. And that is taking place tomorrow evening at 4 p.m. Pacific time. If you haven't purchased a ticket yet or a party pack, we welcome you all to do so. You can find more information on our website, fightingblindness.org. It should pop up immediately. The host is Wayne Brady, and we will have very fun party rooms. So I would encourage you all to join us for an exciting Sunday after late afternoon, early evening. And then additionally, upcoming events in Southern California, we have our Orange County Vision Walk, which is taking place on Saturday, May 21st at Mason Regional Park in Irvine. And then we have our Bay Area Vision Walk on June 4th at Golden Gate Park. So if you live in the Orange County or Bay Area locations, we'd love to have you join us for the walks. And going back a step, we actually have kickoffs. Um, they're going to be virtual and if you are interested, please don't hesitate to reach out to Nathan or myself, and I'm happy to share more information. The Orange County kickoff will be on April 23rd on Zoom in the morning, and the Bay Area kickoff will be on April 9th on Zoom in the morning. So that's really everything I have going on. Uh, but does anyone have any questions about any of our events that we're holding this spring? Okay, well, thank you all for having me. I hope you all can join us and thank you for joining us for the wonderful session and I'm gonna pass it back to Nathan. Great, thanks Michelle. And thanks for jumping in at the perfect time for our commercial break. Uh, <laughs> My pleasure. Casey is back with us, so we'll kick it right back to Casey. Oh, well, sorry about that. I had a little internet blip, but I'm here to answer any questions. Um, and I can't, unfortunately can't see the chat because I got kicked off. I cannot beat the chat. One second, sorry. Okay. Okay, Casey. Um, a question from the audience, just to confirm um, that 
L-H-O-N is not part of this testing program, is that correct? And then you and your team at Informed DNA are able to guide L-H-O-N patients to the right testing, paid testing, is that correct? Yeah, so the um, the labor hereditary, hereditary optic neuropathy, or LHAN, um, is not part of this testing. Um, however, um, we would certainly hope that someone with an LHAN diagnosis probably wouldn't go through the My Retina Tracker program because that um, isn't an indication for participation. Um, but if so, um, we would be able to talk about the limitations of testing and possibly other testing that might be appropriate, um, either to be ordered by your doctor and paid through insurance. Um, or sometimes if we have a patient who just comes to us um, with a private referral. So instead of talking through My Retina Tracker uh, sponsors, we are billing your Anthem or whatever insurance. Um, and at that point, we are able to order and coordinate testing. And we have no other questions in the chat. Were there any more from the, the live audience who wanted to come off of mute and, and ask a question? Now, can I ask you guys a question? Uh, for those of you who have not done genetic counseling uh, or genetic testing, is that something that you think you'll do? Um, some potentially through my retina tracker, um, or if you have any hesitations, I'd love to hear what they are so I can address them. I know I've already spoken to some of you. And we'll, we'll follow up to, with today's meeting and the recording with, with Casey's contact information. So if you want to ask, ask any questions confidentially, you can reach out to Casey directly um, and get those answered. Well, thank you. Okay. Thank you so much, Casey. And Sherry, great job uh, interviewing. You've got a new calling, I think. Thanks so much. I enjoyed it. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Great, everyone. Well, thank you so much. Have a wonderful weekend. We look forward to hosting many more of these educational events, hopefully in person in the near future. So look out for announcements from your, from your local chapter and have a wonderful weekend. Enjoy the rest of your Saturday. Thank you to both of our presenters. Thank you to Jesse and Sherry and the rest of the Los Angeles chapter leadership team for putting this amazing event on today. And uh, we look forward to the next one. Nathan, thank you. I mention April 6th or not yet? Actually, yeah, yeah. We, we have our next Community Connections call coming up on April 6th. This is open to anybody on the West Coast. It's, a, it's an agenda-free open forum where we have breakout rooms where people can connect with each other and, and find local community with each other. And, and basically, it's, it's like I said, it's, it's unscripted, a networking opportunity for you to connect with, the, with your local community. And that's coming up on April 6th at 6.30. So stay tuned to your email inboxes for that invite and more events like this. Great. Thank Thanks you. for the reminder, Sherry. Thanks, everyone. Thank, Thank you guys you. so much for being here. I really appreciate you, Sherry and Nathan. You guys are absolutely amazing. Thank you guys so much. <laughs> Bye, Jess. Bye, guys. Bye, everyone. Have a great weekend. You too.